Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We are so happy to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. And tonight we return to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we're back to our study of the book of Numbers. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 22. We'll be there in just a moment. As always, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. Send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can call or send a text to 608-224-0274. But as I said, tonight we're back to the book of Numbers, and tonight we hope to do a fairly quick overview of Numbers 22 through 25. I know it's a big chunk of scripture. We'll be reading the passages, but not having too much commentary on it, just enough so we can uh, get an idea of what's in there, maybe spark our interest in further study. Uh, these four chapters all go together, and they are related to a prophet by the name of Balaam. In the past, I've referred to this man as being rent a prophet, and I did a series of lessons in sermon form on this uh, just a few years ago, so feel free to look that up on our website if you want more information. Uh, in the big picture, just by way of review, since I've been out for a few weeks, the book of Numbers is a book of numbers, and uh, the book basically covers the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. We've got a census near the beginning of the wandering. We've got a census near the end of the wandering, right before they cross over the Jordan River, thus the name Numbers. And it uh, comes in a time in the history of God's people where they whine and they complain over and over and over again due to an ongoing lack of faith in God. The last time we were together in this study, we looked at Numbers 21, where the people started moving north toward the Promised Land. They completely destroy several nations along the way. They offer terms of peace, as they were instructed to do. They offer to pass through without consuming any resources. We're just going to stay on the highway. We'll leave you alone. You leave us alone, and so on. And the various kings along the way object to that, and they fight back. And the Israelites wipe them off the face of the earth at God's direction. So uh, this brings us to the next king along the way directly across the Jordan River from Jericho. And I think it's interesting that we've just been studying Rahab over the past month or so. So this is right in the same time period. The Israelites are now right on the other side of the Jordan. The local king is obviously concerned about this to say the least. So this brings us tonight to Numbers chapter 22 verses 1 through 6. This will be our first paragraph, Numbers 22 verses 1 through 6. Then the sons of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan opposite Jericho. Now Balak the son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous. And Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this horde will lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. So he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river, in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, a people came out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the surface of the land, and they are living opposite me. Now, therefore, please come, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. Well, Balak, king of Moab, then sees millions of Israelites camped out basically in his backyard. And this king is completely terrified. These people are going to lick up our resources like an ox licks up grass. And so Balak sends messengers to this guy named Balaam. And he is known as a prophet of some kind. That's about all we know. We don't know too much about Balaam at this point. He does seem to have a hotline to God like the other prophets do. Uh, but he doesn't really appear to be an Israelite. It seems that he comes from up north somewhere. And so God then appears to have prophets outside the nation of Israel. And I know a lot of times we don't think about it in those terms, but God did in fact communicate with people outside his chosen people. Um, however, and we're going to learn more about this going forward, Balaam does seem to be highly motivated by money. He is a for-profit prophet, I think we might say, or as I've described him from time to time, as I mentioned earlier, he is a rent-a-prophet. 
and I, I think this will help us understand what happens over the next several chapters. He seems to say the right things for the most part, but as King Balak keeps offering sacrifices that, uh, that Balaam can keep, so there's kind of a, a mo motivation there, and as King Balak keeps increasing the amount of his donations and those sacrifices, Balaam knows what God's going to say. But he keeps checking back, and the way I look at that in context over the next several chapters, it's almost as if he hopes that God may give a different answer so that he can get paid even more. So, yes, God has said uh, that I'm not supposed to curse you, but let me check one more time. But let me check one more time. But let me check again. And uh, every time he checks, he gets these sacrifices. So there's certainly a greed aspect of this when he should have just said no and backed away from it. I think that's what a wise prophet would have done. So this is where it starts. Balak, the king of Moab, knows that Balaam is a, is a successful prophet. The people he blesses are blessed. The people he curses are cursed. This is a legit prophet. So King Balak sends messengers to Balaam, hoping he could convince Balaam to curse the Israelites so that the Moabites then stand a chance of defeating the Israelites. So let's continue with Numbers 22, verses 7 through 14. Numbers 22, 7 through 14. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's words to him. He said to them, Spend the night here, and I will bring word back to you as the Lord may speak to me. And the leaders of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent word to me. Behold, there is a people who came out of Egypt, and they cover the surface of the land. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I may be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam arose in the morning and said to Balak's leaders, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. The leaders of Moab arose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Well, first of all, let's notice the emphasis on the fact that the elders of Moab and Midian have combined forces. They head out to find Balaam, and they come to him with the fees for divination. So they come bearing gifts, and we don't know exactly what this is, gold, silver, something else, something to offer. But they repeat the message from the king. Uh, Balaam relays all this to the Lord. The Lord very clearly says, do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. And that's it. God is abundantly clear here. Uh, nothing is unclear. Uh, Balaam relays this to the leaders. They go back, and then they relay this to Balak the king. So let's see what happens next as we continue in Numbers 22, 15 through 21. The next paragraph here, Numbers 22, 15 through 21. Then Balak again sent leaders, more numerous and more distinguished than the former. They came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I beg you, hinder you from coming to me, for I will indeed honor you richly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Please come then, curse this people for me. Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could do nothing, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. Now please, you also stay here tonight, and I will find out what else the Lord will speak to me. God came to Balaam at night and said, If the men have come to call you, Rise up and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you shall you do. So Balaam arose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the leaders of Moab. Balak then is not giving up, is he? And so this king sends more leaders, a larger number of leaders, more distinguished, uh, more important than before, maybe members of his cabinet or however we would say that today. And this time, notice they come with a promise of even more financial reward. If only Balaam will curse the Israelites. And uh, Balaam has a pretty good response, doesn't he? Even if Balak were to give me an entire house full of, full, uh, full of gold and silver, uh, I still couldn't come and curse the Israelites. However, instead of sending the dignitaries straight back home, as I think he probably should have done, notice Balaam invites them to spend the night. 
and he offers to check in with God one more time. And, and I think that right there was completely unnecessary, but it's almost as if Balaam is hoping that God might change his mind. That's kind of the way I look at that, you know, so that maybe he can get some of this reward. I mean, look, there's a lot of silver and gold on the line here. Let me just, let me just double check. Let me make sure. And let me just kind of check in with God again. So it's not explicitly stated, but I think we see it with the offer of wealth and uh, Balaam agreeing to check in with God again. That, to me, that makes sense. And this time, notice God seems to tell Balaam to go. And there's some discussion on the grammar of this. It's conditional, and they don't seem to meet the conditions if they do this and so on. So, I don't know. In my mind, we have something of a mixed message here. Um, but then again, Balaam does have freedom of choice. Balaam is going to do what he's going to do. And I kind of, I might compare it to a husband pestering his wife about maybe, I don't know, going on an expensive hunting trip. So since I don't go on hunting trips, I'm going to use this as an example so I don't get myself in trouble. Um, so imagine a husband saying, you know, I really want to, I want to go on this hunting trip and it's, you know, it's a, it's a long way away. I'm going to need these supplies. I'm going to need these, you know, more of this and that to get this thing going. And he really wants to go. And he's been talking about it for weeks. He's just kind of obsessing over this and his wife says no you know over and over no this is not the right thing to do but then finally in the heat of the moment she says fine just go now for those of us who are married <laughs> or for those of us I think who may understand that illustration is the wife really fine with her husband going on that trip I think uh, most of us hopefully understand uh, no of course not However, she understands that if he's going to go, he's going to go. And in my opinion, that is pretty much what we have here. Balaam is really wanting the reward. God has said no, but Balaam insists. And the way I look at it, God allows it. Fine, go ahead, but only say what you're supposed to say. So let's continue with Numbers 22, verses 22 through 30. Numbers 22, 22 through 30. But God was angry because he was going. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned off from the way and went into the field, but Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path of the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right hand or the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam was angry and struck the donkey with his stick. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you, that you have struck me these three times? <laughs> then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a mockery of me. If there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. So again, God allows him to go, but notice God's angry that he goes. So the angel of the Lord blocks his way, and I won't recount the whole story. We just read it. Uh, we'll kind of leave it at that. But one of the most amazing things here is that the donkey speaks to Balaam. I mean, that's unreal. That This is obviously miraculous. However, if there's anything even more amazing than that, I think it's that Balaam responds to his donkey. I think that right there is even more surprising than the donkey speaking. So completely bizarre. Uh, Balaam displeases the Lord. He ends up having a, a conversation with his donkey. So they've got a little bit of a relationship going on here. They're having this conversation like they've, you know, been friends for years or whatever. Kind of a really strange thing going on. So uh, let's continue with Numbers 22, 31 through 35, the next paragraph. Numbers 22, 31 through 35. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed all the way to the ground. The angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary, because your way was contrary to me. But the donkey saw me and turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I would surely have killed you just now and let her live. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. 
for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it is displeasing to you, I will turn back. But the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but you shall speak only the word which I tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of Balak. So God then opens Balaam's eyes, and God explains why the donkey's been talking to him. Uh, the donkey saved his life, didn't she? And so don't be beating the donkey. It's not her fault. Uh, Balaam offers to turn back. God allows him to continue, but he's only to speak what God tells him to speak. I think he kind of owed his uh, donkey an apology here. I don't know about you, but uh, I think he should have maybe gone a little bit further here and apologized to her. Oh, but this sets us up for what happens next. So let's continue with the next paragraph, Numbers 22, verses 36 through 41. Numbers 22, 36 through 41. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the Arnon border at the extreme end of the border. Then Balak said to Balaam, Did I not urgently send to you to call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I really unable to honor you? So Balaam said to Balak, Behold, I have come to you uh, now to you. Am I able to speak anything at all? The word that God puts in my mouth that I shall speak. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kiriath Huzath. Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent some to Balaam and the leaders who were with him. Then it came about in the morning that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal, and he saw from there a portion of the people. As I see it, King Balak is concerned about the delay. You know, why did it take Balaam so long to get there? Balaam gives this defense. He says that he'll only say what God wants him to say. And then King Balak takes Balaam to an overlook, to a high place where Baal is worshipped. And Balak does this to show Balaam just a portion of the Israelites. Uh, that group is so large, you can't even see them all from one place. So he's just looking at part, part of them. So this sets the stage for what happens next in Numbers 23 and 24, ultimately also in Numbers 25 as well. Uh, but in the next two chapters, we're going to read through these rather quickly, Balaam is given three more opportunities to prophesy against Israel for profit. So it's kind of uh, three little sub-events going on here. So let's pick up with the first of these three opportunities in Numbers 23 verses 1 through 12. And I know we'll have a lot of text on the screen here. If you need to, look that up in your own Bible. I hope you will. hope you are already. But Numbers 23, 1 through 12, the first of the three opportunities to prophesy in person. Then Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. Balak did just as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered up a bull and a ram in each offer, altar. Then Balaam said to Balak, Stand beside your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me, and whatever he shows me I will tell you. So he went to a bare hill. Now God met Balaam, and he said to him, I have set up the seven altars, and I have offered up a bull and a ram in each altar. Then the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and you shall speak thus. So he returned to him, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering, he and all the leaders of Moab, he took up his discourse and said, From Aram, Balak has brought me. Moab's king from the mountains of the east, come curse Jacob for me and, denou and come denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? As I see him from the top of the rocks, and I look at him from the hills, behold a people who dwells apart and will not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright, and let my end be like his. Then Balak said to Balaam, What have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have actually blessed them. He replied, Must I not be careful to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? And again, we're not going to go through this line by line, but there's a pattern here, and I want us to keep an eye out for this pattern in the following two uh, examples of prophecy. So first of all, there is an offer of wealth. In this case, it's in the form of seven bulls and seven rams. And of course, the prophet is able to keep some of that profit. So an offer of wealth. Then we've got Balaam getting a word from the Lord. But the prophecy comes out as a blessing, not a curse, as Balak wants. And then we have King Balak getting mad that Balaam didn't curse the Israelites. So the offer of wealth the blessing that pops out instead of a curse as Balak wanted, and then we have uh, King Balak's anger about that. All right, let's continue then with the second of the three opportunities. This is Numbers 23, 13 through 26. Numbers 23, 13 through 26. 
Then Balak said to him, Please come with me to another place from where you may see them, although you will only see the extreme end of them and will not see all of them, and curse them for me from there. So he took him to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars, and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. And he said to Balak, Stand here beside your burnt offering, while I myself meet the Lord over there. Then the Lord met Balaam, and put a word in his mouth, and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. He came to him, and behold, he was standing beside his burnt offering, and the leaders of Moab with him. And Balak said to him, What has the Lord spoken? Then he took up his discourse, and said, Arise, O Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. When he is blessed, then I cannot revoke it. He has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He is for them, like the horns of the wild ox. For there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel what God has done. Behold, a people rises like a lioness, and as a lion it lifts itself. It will not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Then Balak said to Balaam, Do not curse them at all, nor bless them at all. But Balaam replied to Balak, Did I not tell you whatever the Lord speaks, that I must do? And again, we're not going to go through this line by line, but we see that familiar pattern. There is an offer of wealth, in this case, more sacrifices. Then we've got Balaam getting a word from the Lord, but the prophecy comes out as a blessing, not as a curse like Balak wants. And then finally, we have number three, we've got King Balak getting mad that Balaam doesn't curse the Israelites. All right, let's continue with now the third of these three opportunities. This is Numbers 23, 27, going all the way down through chapter 24, verse 14. It all goes together. We'll just look at it at the same time. Numbers 23, 27 and following. Then Balak said to Balaam, Please come, I will take you to another place. Perhaps it will be agreeable with God that you curse them for me from there. So Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, which overlooks the wasteland. Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me here. Balak did just as Balaam had said, and offered up a bull and a ram on each altar. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go, as at other times, to seek omens, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him. He took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down yet having his eyes uncovered. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from his buckets, and his seed will be by many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He will devour the nations who are his adversaries, and will crush their bones in pieces, and shatter them with his arrows. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him. Blessed is everyone who blesses you, and cursed is everyone who curses you. Then Balak's anger burned against Balaam, and he struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have persisted in blessing them these three times. Therefore, flee to your place now. I said I would honor you greatly, but behold, the Lord has held you back from honor. Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers whom you had sent to me, saying, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything contrary to the command of the Lord, either good or bad, of my own accord. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. And now, behold, I am going to my people. Come, and I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the days to come. Again, we're not going to go through this line by line, but we see the familiar pattern once again. An offer of wealth, in this case, more sacrifices. Then we've got Balaam getting a word from the Lord. The prophecy comes out as a blessing, not a curse, as Balak wants. And then we have King Balak getting mad 
that Balaam didn't curse the Israelites. Notice in verse 10 how Balak gets angry and strikes his hands together. Uh, that right there is one of just a few references to clapping in Scripture. And I'll just tell you, most of those references are not good. And it's not good here. Balak is extremely angry. He claps, he slams his hands together. He's now sacrificed a number of animals. Uh, he's made a number of financial offers. And Balaam continues blessing Israel. So his rent-a-prophet is not really working out too well. And notice he now tells Balaam that the Lord has held you back from honor. In other words, I am trying my best to make you a wealthy man, but your God won't let me do it. And so Balaam then basically says, I'm going home, uh, but not after making at least one more prophecy. So this brings us to Numbers 24, verses 15 through 25. Numbers 24, 15 through 25. He, that is Balaam, took up his discourse and said, The oracle of Balaam the son of Beor, and the oracle of the man whose eye is opened, the oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down yet having his eyes uncovered. I see him now, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be a possession, Seir, its enemies, also will be a possession, while Israel performs valiantly. One from Jacob shall have dominion, and will destroy the remnant from the city. And he looked at Amalek, and took up his discourse, and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his end shall be destruction. And he looked at the Kenite, and took up his discourse, and said, Your dwelling place is enduring, and your nest is set in the cliff. Nevertheless, Cain will be consumed. How long will Asher keep you captive? Then he took up his discourse, and said, Alas, who can live except God has ordained it? But ships shall come from the coast of Ketim, and they shall afflict Asher, and will afflict Eber. So they also will come to destruction. Then Balaam arose, and departed, and returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. Again, we're not going to look at this verse by verse, uh, but it doesn't go too well for Balak, does it? In this vision, Balaam sees a scepter rising up from Jacob and crushing through the forehead of Moab. So not good for Balak. Uh, in fact, he predicts the Israelites are going to uh, conquer all of the surrounding nations as well. And in the end, after this devastating prophecy, Balaam gets up and leaves and Balak goes home as well. Well, this brings us to Numbers 25. I know we've moved rather quickly, and it may seem unrelated until we kind of slow down and think about the context of this. And as we think about a passage from the New Testament, I think it'll make more sense in just a few moments. But let's just start by looking at Numbers 25, 1 through 9. Numbers 25, 1 through 9. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab, for they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought his relatives, brought to his relatives a Midianite woman. In the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. So we've got Balak trying to get Balaam to curse Israel for money in the previous three chapters. Balaam seems to try because he wanted the money, but whenever he tries to curse, a blessing pops out instead of a curse. And then here we are with no transition at all from the end of chapter 24 into chapter 25. 
we suddenly have God punishing the people for committing sexual sin with the daughters of Moab and for joining themselves to Baal. What in the world? Uh, what's going on here? What's the connection? I mean, I, we don't have much here in terms of a connection. But over in Revelation chapter 2, as Jesus is sending a message to the church in Pergamum, he condemns them in part by saying in Revelation 2.14, but I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of sexual immorality. Whoa, that is new information, isn't it? We didn't have that explanation here in Numbers 24 leading into chapter 25. Uh, but it comes to us in the very last book of the Bible. And so here we learn that Balaam apparently taught the people to participate in idol worship and to commit sexual sin all through temptation that would be coming from Balak and his people. And then in 2 Peter 2.15, Peter condemns some false teachers back in the first century who had followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So if I could combine what we've learned here in Numbers, as well as what we learn in Revelation 2.14, as well as what we learn in 2 Peter 2.15, I think if we could combine all of that, I think what we learn here, Balaam really wanted the money. But God, no matter what he would say, or no matter how time, many times or different ways he asked, God would not curse the people. And so in order to get the payout, I think that Balaam found a workaround. So God won't curse the people directly. However, God will punish his people if they sin. And so Balak, all you really need to do is to tempt God's people to sin. And if his people end up sinning, God is going to end up cursing them after all. So I hope you followed along with that, but I, I think that's what's going on here. God's not going to curse them directly, but if Balak can get them to sin, then God will uh, basically curse them on his behalf over a different issue. But the bottom line is the result will be the same. And in a sense, it works, doesn't it? The people worship the gods of the Moabites, they worship Baal, they join in with the sacrifices, and they commit sexual sin with their young women. And God gets angry. So angry, in fact, that God tells Moses to start killing anyone who has sinned. So Balak is thinking, this is, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. All right. In the middle of it, though, I want us to notice we have a special case that seems to go above and beyond. As everybody is weeping over the pronouncement of judgment from God, one of the sons of the leaders of the people brings his new girlfriend, a daughter of a leader from among the Moabites. We're going to learn about that later, who she is. This young Israelite man brings this young woman in. They walk right in in front of Moses and this huge assembly. And it almost seems like they might have been fornicating with each other right there in public. However, when Phineas sees this, he doesn't even wait for the okay from Moses. But this man gets so mad that he immediately spears both of these two through their bodies. And that's why some have suggested that they might have been fornicating right there. Um, they are obviously close enough to each other that Phineas spears them through simultaneously. Whatever they were doing, it just made him so mad. And without even asking permission, he just javelins or spears, he just uh, jabs both of them through at the same time. Well, at this play, uh, point, the plague comes to an end. God's kind of impressed by that, uh, but not before 24,000 people had died. So that kind of shows us how many were overtaken in this. It was a huge deal. All right, let's wrap it up tonight with Numbers 25, 10 through 18, the last chunk here. Numbers 25, 10 through 18. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned, my, uh, turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give him my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. Now the name of the slain man of Israel who was slain with the Midianite woman was Zimri the son of Salu, a leader of a father's household among the Simeonites. The name of the Midianite woman who was slain was Kazbai, the daughter of Zur, who was the head of the people of a father's household in Midian. 
Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Be hostile to the Midianites and strike them, for they have been hostile to you with their tricks, with which they have deceived you in the affair of Peor and in the affair of Kazbai, the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister, who was slain on the day of the plague because of Peor. Well, at the end here, God commends Phineas. This is how you do it. I'm giving this man a promotion. I think that's the way I would summarize. This, this is it. Uh, have that zeal. And we have the names of the couple. Both were children of the leaders from their respective clans. And God then commands Moses, go to war with the Midianites because of their deception. And this is where we learn that this idolatry and this sexual sin were not random. They were not just randomly tempted, but this was all part of a scheme. We don't have the details here, but in the New Testament, we find that Balaam was the coordinator of that scheme uh, due to his love of money, combining 2 Peter and Revelation chapter 2, the knowledge that we have from there. In terms of a practical lesson, I, there's a whole lot in these chapters, um, but I, I take that personally. Uh, preachers need to be very careful that we are not improperly motivated by money, and it is a temptation. You know, if I don't preach on this issue, we may gain more members. You know, if I'm quiet here, if I say this and not that and vice versa, we may gain some more members, may make me more financially secure and, and so on. Um, so there is a temptation to be improperly motivated by money. And I think we learn here we're to be very careful not to go the way of Balaam. And again, a lesson from Phineas. I mean, the zeal this guy has in seeing sin and taking care of it is uh, pretty amazing. So this brings us to the end of Numbers 25. Uh, next week, I think we're going to get to the second and the final census. So I hope you can join us for that. As always, thank you for being with us tonight. If there's something we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can help or encourage you, let us know. Reach out with an email, info at fourlikeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's all go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight for being the one and only all-powerful God. Thank you for being our Father, and thank you for telling us about the history of your people as they wandered in the wilderness. Tonight we ask for your help as we live out our lives on this earth, merely passing through just as they pass through the wilderness. We ask for your help as we learn from their example. We pray that you would keep us from whining and complaining, protect us from temptation, protect us from the evil one, and help us to encourage one another as we should to that end. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We do love you, and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.